Well, um, we've already had two or three sermons. and You had enough? You want some more? Huh? Well, you know, these things are important. I don't feel bad about taking time on this because, uh, uh, you know, the people who don't like to hear those things are the people who are not doing them. If you're in the thick of believing for something and standing and walking by faith, I mean, your ears perk up, you go, hey, yeah, yeah, tell me. Tell me, right? Because you're a doer. You're in the middle of it. You want input. But the people who are bored and aggravated and don't want to hear it are the people who are not doers. They're not walking by faith. They're being lazy spiritually. And uh, like we said, you know, you've got two kind of folks that go to church. Really, you do. And you've got folks that just come to say they went. And to salve their conscience, they feel like it's part of being a Christian. Christians ought to go to church. Uh, but they don't enjoy it. And uh, they don't want to be there any longer than they have to. They'd like a drive through church. <laughs> or better yet, you know, stay at home. Uh, and, and, you know, some other way. But uh, no, you got, you got another group of people that come to get something and to give something. Right? And, uh, you know, it's worth, you know, worth investing the time. And it's not just, you know, showing up. Did we get what we came after? Did we do what we came to do? And, and until we do, we ought to stay with it. Until right. we get it. Now, if I was uh, uh, better and more developed at ministering, maybe I could do it quicker and more efficiently. And if you were more developed at receiving, maybe you'd get it quicker. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> so, but I'm not going to throw rocks at you and you don't throw them at me. I'm going to cut you some slack. You cut me some slack, so to speak. And let's just stay with it till we get it, right? If it took us, you know, an extra 30 minutes, what's, what does that mean? As long as we got it and we did it. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, Hebrews this evening. I think you can take some more. Hebrews chapter 13, and if you didn't bring a Bible with you, hold up your hand. Our ushers have extra Bibles. If you didn't bring yours tonight, use one of ours. Turn to Hebrews 13. Turn with us from verse to verse. How many read your chapters this week every day? Let me see. Oh, good, good. I'm looking in the camera now. Did you read your chapters? In China, did you read yours? Okay, Africa. Europeans always read their chapters too. <laughs> Canadians, yes. Right, good, good. Uh, if, you know, if you've gotten behind, don't quit. Uh, you know, just repent and if you feel like you're too far behind, well, just start where everybody else is on Monday, but don't just quit. Right? And there's no such thing as being too busy. No such thing. Uh, it's just a matter of priority. And uh, the Word should be first place in your life. Man, it does so much for you. It feeds your spirit. I wouldn't emphasize it like I do if it wasn't so important. But it is. And so if you haven't been doing that, the bookmarks are out in the uh, uh, information area. Pick that up and hook up with us on uh, next uh, on Monday. What is it Monday? Uh, Second John? Is that right? Second John is Monday, and then, of course, Tuesday would be uh, Third John, right? So uh, hook up with us. Hebrews 13 and 5. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let your conversation, that word means your manner of life, your way of living, your conduct, let it be what? Without covetousness. And that's the name of our series, without covetousness. And when the Lord tells us to live a life completely free from, uh, without any covetousness, should we take that seriously? Yes, sir. 
And that's what we're doing in these weeks and, and days. We are taking this commandment very seriously. And we're not trying to judge each other, but we're looking to identify any of the ugly stuff in ourselves and get rid of it and get it out. Because the further we go into it, I think you can see, in fact, in, in the Psalms, it said the Lord abhors the covetous. Strong words. I mean, it's something he really despises. And it is, Colossians 3 says, that covetousness is idolatry. It's like falling down and worshiping a golden calf or praying to a rock. Now, that's bad. And so we should not say, well, I guess everybody's a little greedy now and then. I guess everybody's a little covetous. Well, that's like saying, well, I guess everybody worships idols a little bit here and there. Well, no, we should have zero tolerance for covetousness. And so uh, let me review a little bit. For those of you that haven't been with us, you can uh, get the previous uh, lessons in the Word Supply. You can download them for free off the Internet, uh, get caught up with us. But we talked about what covetousness is. We said uh, the definitions are to desire. To covet something means to desire something. It means to long for something. Long for it. One definition is to sigh for. What does that mean? <sighs> what does that mean? We'd say in good old southern Missouri and North Arkansas language, you want it bad. <laughs> want it. We'd say, we'd say want. Want it. Oh, you want it. Mm, you want it so bad. Long for it. Well, just the word covetous, uh, sometimes we think, uh, you know, that it could ha not have any good connotation. But yet the scripture says, covet earnestly the best gifts. Yes, so is it all right to long for the manifestation of the Spirit of God in your life? Yes. To really, really want yes. the word of knowledge and word of wisdom and Amen. faith and working the miracles, and gifts of healings, and right? Long for these things. Want them, desire them. Yes, he told us to. Covet earnestly these things. But can a believer, can a Christian long for something they should not desire? Yeah, they can. And that's where the problems come in. Uh you don't have to turn there, but let me read these to you. Uh, Exodus 20 says, this is, you know, the, of the Ten Commandments. This is actually the tenth one. The Lord said, he wrote it in stone with his own finger. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is your neighbor's. That's Exodus 20, verse 17. Also in Deuteronomy 5, 11, Deuteronomy 5, excuse me, 5, 21, 5, 21, neither shall you desire your neighbor's wife, neither shall you covet your neighbor's house, his field, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his ass, or anything that is your neighbor's. The Living Bible says it like this, You must not burn with desire for another man's wife, or envy him for his home. In fact, you know, we saw that in Exodus 20, 17 in the Living last Friday. It said, You must not be envious of your neighbor's house or whatever else that the list went on. Uh, because, you know, that ties right in with covetousness. It's, it's so uh, close that it's, it's used interchangeably. To envy somebody's stuff, what, what does that mean? It means you want it. You want what they've got. And in fact, you know, envy goes beyond that. And if I can't have it, doesn't want you to have it. Try to take it away from you some way. That is devilish. 
isn't it? You cannot envy somebody walking in love. It is impossible to envy somebody if you're walking in the love of God, if you're keeping the New Testament commandment. Right? In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, we read that last Friday. You know, love doesn't envy. Envy is not. Why? Well, love cares about you. And if you've got something I want or that I would like to have, love's happy for you. Right? But faith believes I can have one too. Right? Yeah, but he's got the perfect wife and I wanted her. No. You've got to love him and be happy that he's got this wonderful wife. And not want to hurt him or her. And then you got to have faith that God could still give you a wonderful wife or husband without you imposing in somebody else's relationship and coveting their spouse. Right? Mr. Well, I'm already married and I'm unhappy. And there's, there, you know, I think his wife would make me happy. Well, you think wrong. There was a time when you thought your wife would make you happy. <laughs> right? What happened? <laughs> it takes faith. Even if you're in a relationship where there is no feeling of love anymore. There's been so many you know, fights and so many arguments and so many hard words and hard things said until, you know, you just don't even want to be around them. They don't even want to be around you. It's like the Israelites when they came through the, the Red Sea and they went three days and they couldn't find any water, but they found a little water hole and they went to drink it and it was mara. It was bitter. Oh, it was bad. You couldn't drink it. And you know what, they were, I'm sure they were convinced, we need a new water hole. This one's bad. But did they need a new water hole? No. Moses prayed for the people and the Lord showed him a tree. Wonder if that's prophetic. Did anything happen on a tree for you and me? And when he cast that tree into the waters, the bitter waters became sweet. Oh, somebody ought to shout on this. I'm telling you, I don't care how bad it has been. Experts may have told you, it's unfixable. Just forget it. Just divorce. Just forget it. Hey, you got a God with whom nothing's impossible. A God who can make the bitter sweet. But you got to have faith. You got to believe, no matter how bad it has been, no matter how bad it is at this moment, you got to believe God can give you and give you spouse everything that you need and desire with each other. Amen. He can change you, He can change them. It may not happen in three days, but faith people will stand Amen. and won't quit. I've seen it. I've, I know of some situations right now where people are even in the ministry. And they have absolute model marriages. But if you'd have known them 15 years ago, you would not be able to put the two pictures together in your mind. I mean, it was terrible. The, the worst. But they didn't quit. I said they didn't quit. So why would you have to covet another man's wife or a, a lady would have to covet another man's husband or family or life or job. That's lack of faith. Amen. You don't have to covet another man's car. They make new cars every day. <laughs> and the new ones are improved. Yes, right? You don't have to covet somebody's house. You can have a house that good or better. Amen. Right? Yes, Believe for your own. Yes. Be glad for them that they got that. And believe for your own. We are commanded not to let ourselves desire or want our brother or sister's stuff. Amen. Our life or spouse or anything that is theirs. It's a commandment. He didn't say try not to do it. We are forbidden to desire our brother or sister's anything. 
Right? Are we serious about keeping this? Said out loud, I am not covetous. I don't have to be. God will give me my own. I'm glad for my brother, for my sister. I'm glad for them. I rejoice with them. And I will not desire what is theirs. Now in talking about this, I'd like for you to go to uh, the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. What we're talking about here is temptation. Temptation. You have been, and you might be in the future, tempted to lust after, long after, desire somebody's whatever. You could be tempted. But temptation is not sin. Y'all going to have to listen close with me tonight. This is really important things. Said out loud, temptation, temptation. Isn't, sin. isn't sin. See, just because you were tempted to want their stuff doesn't mean you sinned. Right? Because you don't have to yield to that temptation. You can resist that. In Hebrews 2, we see revelation about Jesus. Hebrews, the second chapter, and verse 14. Hebrews 2. And 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Who took part of the same? Jesus. If you back up and read the previous verses, it's talking about Jesus. He took part of the same. He took part of, of, of a body like ours? No. The same. Not just similar, the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Amen. Did he do it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. And, and as a result of him destroying him that had the power of death, he delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Did he do it? Yes, sir. Then are we? Yes. Are we delivered from the fear of dying and death? Yes. It's sad that so many Christians are not. So many Christians are just full of fear. And when you strip everything away, it's a fear of dying. Well, I'm afraid of driving in traffic. That's a fear of dying. I'm afraid of flying. That's a fear of dying. Are you with me? I'm afraid somebody's going to break in the house. That's a fear of dying. And when you have absolutely no fear of death, you are free. <laughs> so what if we die? <laughs> the Lord tears is coming. We are going to die. Every one of us. The Lord tears is coming just a little while. None of us are making it out of this alive. Amen. <laughs> I said, if the Lord tears is coming just a little while, none of us are making it out of this alive. Physically, you're going to die. Someone said, well, he may come. Well, he may. But he wouldn't have to wait long. For you and me to run out of time. <laughs> if a day with him as is a thousand years, if he waited an extra five minutes, that's too long for me and you. <laughs> for a lot of us. Anyway, the issue is not death. The issue is the fear of dying. 
And you should not have any, I mean no, fear of dying. Why? Because you're saved. And if you're not, don't you dare leave this place tonight till you get that way. Right? Saved, born again, name in the Lamb's book of life. So what happens to you when you die? What happens to you? You go. And you look at your old body. And you go, wow. That's over. And your angel is there and he goes, hey. You go, whoa. Hey. He says, you ready? He said, you want, let me take you by the scenic route. There's some neat stuff in the Milky Way. You need to see you go. Show me everything. Show me. Yeah, let's go. Is that something to be scared of? That's, that's not a fairy tale. That's reality. Did you know this is one of the shortest things we will ever do? This life. It's one of the briefest. Isn't it? It's one of the shortest things we will ever do. He's, the Lord says, what is your life? It's what? It's a puff. Now you see it. Now you know. That's you. In the earth. And people say, Oh, Brother Keith, I wish you wouldn't talk about dying. This bothers me. Well, that's why we're talking about it. As long as it bothers you, you're not free. And you're not free because you don't know and are not doing the truth. You know the truth. And the truth will make you free. And the truth is, Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death. And that's why you and I can stand by the graveside. Are you listening? And we can quote 1 Corinthians 15 and we say, Oh grave, where is your victory? Death, where's your bite? Well, what are we doing? We're sassing death. (laughs) We're going, death, whoop-de-doo. You ain't nothing. Jesus conquered you. Mrs. says, oh, they're dead, they're dead. No, their body's asleep, they're gone. And that body's going to be changed. It's a win-win deal. <laughs> Unless you don't believe these things. Then you're going to be full of fear. Oh, I'm so afraid. What if I don't make it? What if this don't happen? What if that don't happen? No, he has delivered them who were through the fear of death all their lifetime subject to bondage. But now that you've been delivered from all the fear of death, you are no longer subject to the bondages that accompany it. You can be and live free. Free. Now keep reading. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Jesus did not have an angelic body. What did he have? He had a body just like yours and mine. Now, a lot of people don't like this. And if you're real religious, you know, tonight, <laughs> we may have to pray for you before this is over with. But every, if, if something rubs you the wrong way, do not look at me and get irritated. Am I reading the Bible? Yes. It's what you need to ask yourself. Is that what the Scripture says? And if the scripture says something different than what you thought, well, you need to change what you thought. What kind of body did Jesus have? See, he says it more than one time. He said he didn't take on him uh, the nature of angels, an angelic type body, but the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. In how many things? In some ways. In other ways, of course, he was, his body was divine. And No. What? In how many ways was his body like ours? In all things. Did you see that? You may need to underline it. In how many things? All things. 
It behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, or that means to help them that are tempted. Was Jesus tempted? Does he know what it's like to be tempted? What is temptation? We read it from James. In fact, you're you're not far from there. Hold your place in Hebrews. Turn over to James, the first chapter. And there's some real victory here tonight. Got to think right, though. James 1. Verse 13, what does it say? Let no man say, then nobody ought to say this. When he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Does God tempt people? Should you ever say, God's tempting me. God's tempting me to lie. He's tempting me to steal. He's tempting me to commit adultery, fornication. or no. Let, he said, don't let anybody say that. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man, would this include Jesus? Was he tempted like us? Did he become a man? Yeah, he did. Then this applies to him as well as you. But every man is tempted when what happens? He's drawn away of his own lust. Now the word lust has a bad connotation with us, but really all it means is strong desire. Drawn away of his own desire and what? And enticed. Now the drawn away of his own desire, that's not the devil. That's you. That's me. The enticement, that's the enemy's work. Either himself or through other people or through other things. He, uh, he dangles the carrot. He goes, look at here at this. Yeah. Ain't this something? You know you want it. You know you do. <laughs> look how pretty. Enticement. But that would, be, that would mean nothing if something in you didn't want it. Huh? That's right. If there was nothing in you that wanted it, you'd just look at it and go, put that away. I don't, I don't care about that. And there wouldn't be any temptation. The fact that there's a temptation means that there's something in you that wants it. Are y'all listening now? Can a, a Christian, a good Christian, a person who loves God, can a part of them want something that they're not supposed to have? Can a, a good Christian be tempted to covet, to envy, to desire, to long for something that they should not? Was Jesus tempted? Yes. How, what happens when you're tempted? You're pulled, right, by your own desire and, and enticed. But now, it, does that mean you've sinned? No. no. Read the rest of that passage there in James. Every man, this applies to everybody who's ever been a man, uh, that's male man or female man, everybody that's ever been tempted, this is how it works. You're drawn or pulled away, you're pulled away from what's right and pulled toward something that's wrong by what? 
his own lust or desire and enticed. Then when lust has conceived. So in other words, it's not just instantaneous because you're tempted. You must entertain it. You must feed it and if you do, it will conceive in you. And when lust has conceived, it brings forth what? See, now, now there's sin. Just because there's temptation doesn't mean there was sin. It brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. So can we keep from erring? Messing up, making mistakes, sinning. Can we keep from it? Yes, we can. By not feeding the desire. By not entertaining the thoughts and the feelings. Now, now go back to Hebrews. We were in Hebrews 2. Jesus became a partaker of flesh and blood. Verse 17, in all things... He was made like us. Keep that in mind. Verse 18, he himself has suffered being tempted. Was Jesus tempted? It can be hard for you to imagine that. Somebody said, well, why should we imagine it? Because it'll help you. I said it'll help you. The devil wants to tell you and me that because we're tempted to want something we shouldn't, it's because we're evil. Something's wrong with us. And we're not like Jesus. He was pure and holy. And he never had to deal with those kind of thoughts or those kind of feelings and those kind of temptations. He was and is high and holy. But he did deal with those thoughts. And those feelings, and he was tempted. Are you listening? It sounds a little strange to your head, doesn't it? Is it the Bible or not? Now go on over to the fourth chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then... That we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Now that's also translated confession. Hold fast to it. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That's what a lot of religion will tell you. That Jesus can't really relate to you. Because you got so much junk. I mean the thoughts you've had. The feelings you've had. The temptations you've had. That Jesus couldn't even relate to that. That's a lie. I said that's a lie. We don't have a high priest which can't be touched with the feeling of our weaknesses, but was what? Now here's the Bible. He was what? In all points tempted like as we are. Now let's just stop right here. What does all mean? Do you believe that? Does that mean that there is not a temptation that anybody in this room watching by internet or TV tonight has experienced and gone through that Jesus didn't personally experience himself? Is that true or not? (laughs) You see how weak the amens are though, don't you? It's like, Brother Keith... Jesus is holy. Yes, he is. See, people have equated temptation with sin. 
Temptation is not sin. Being tempted to do something is not a sin. Jesus, the highest, the holiest, was tempted in all points. What does all points mean? See, the devil will tell you, "Uh uh-uh, that ain't true, that ain't true, that ain't true. Jesus was never tempted to do what you've been tempted to do. Well, the Bible's either true or it's not. No, Brother Keith, no, no. B-I-B-L-E. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 50. And this is not like this is some isolated text. We just saw the same thing in chapter 2. In Philippians, it says he emptied himself. He became like other men. In Luke 4, Matthew and, and, and uh Matthew 4, Mark 1, we have uh, detailed information of how he was tempted. We're going to talk about that as time allows. Here's the big difference, the last phrase. (laughs) He was tempted in all points. That covers everything. Brother Keith, tempted to lie? Tempted to any any sin you want to mention? <laughs> oh man, you should see some of the looks I'm getting. <laughs> now, Brother Keith, I just can't accept that that Jesus was tempted to do some of the stuff I'm tempted. Then you don't believe the Bible. That's right. Amen. Now whether you think you like it, whether it makes sense to your religious history or not, you need to throw out the window. Amen. Whether you understand it or not, the Bible is true. This is not taking anything away from the master. So you're just trying to bring him down on our level. That's what he did when he left glory. (laughs) He came down and became a man. Didn't just become like a man. He became a man. Right? Right? In all points and respects, he became like us. And here it says he was tempted in all points. In in how many points? In all points, he was tempted. What's that next phrase, though? Yet without sin. Now, that's different between me and you. (laughs) Because there's nobody in this place... That has never been tempted. And also there is nobody in this place. That has never yielded to a temptation. You have and I have. To say you hadn't means you've never sinned. Which means you would be unique among all humanity. (laughs) Except for Jesus. And we just don't believe that. (laughs) We believe you have been tempted and you have yielded to temptations and you have sinned. And that's why you had to repent. That's why you had to get saved. You had to have your sins forgiven and and cleansed. Right? But is it a sin to be tempted? No. No. Something can pull on you. You can be pulled by your own desire. You can be enticed. Thoughts can come across your mind. Have you sinned? No. No. Jesus was tempted in all points like us, but he never sinned. Why? He did not yield to any of those things. He was tempted. He was pulled, but never yielded to it, proving you never have to. You must say, yeah, but Brother Keith, he's Jesus. I mean, he could do that. No, he did it as a man proving that you or I never have to give in to temptation. Now, if we couldn't help it, we shouldn't be required to repent because it's not our fault. 
But the very reason we're required to repent is because we could have resisted and not given in. That's why we have to confess our sin and and repent. Y'all with me on this? Go to 1 Corinthians, please. 13th chapter. <clears throat> what did I say? It's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You got religion, and then you got the word. You got people's opinions, and then you got the word. Well, preacher, I think that just don't matter at all. (laughs) This is what I think. What I think doesn't matter. What you think doesn't matter. What he said matters. Right? Right? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer or allow you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. What does that mean? Exactly. There is no irresistible temptation. God won't allow it in your life. So what does that mean? If you gave in, it's because you failed. You did not have to. Well, it was just just bigger than, than it just overwhelmed me. And next thing I knew, I had done it. No, uh uh-uh. Nope, it doesn't fly. You could have resisted it. This verse proves it. Right? If it was too big for you to resist, the Lord would not have allowed it. Now go to Luke 4. (laughs) Interesting night. Luke 4. I guess some folks had not read those scriptures before. (laughs) But there they are. Luke 4 is the account of Jesus being tempted. And he was tempted in all points. Like us, yet without sin. Luke 4, verse 1, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned to Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days, what? Tempted. Tempted. Now, did it say the devil tried to tempt him? No. No. What did it say? He was tempted. Now, see, you'll hear some theologians try to say, well, Jesus wasn't tempted by any of that stuff. I mean, he knew what was... No, the Bible said he was tempted. What does that mean? From, we have the definition of temptation in James 1. What happens when you're tempted? You're pulled by your own desire. So was there a part of him and something in him that wanted to do these things? <laughs> you should see some of the looks I'm getting from the cross. If it wasn't, then it was no temptation. He was either tempted or he wasn't. Is temptation a sin? Now see, this is why so many people get stiff when you start talking about that. Because to them, temptation is the same thing as sin. No, it's not. Jesus was tempted. That's beyond dispute. He was tempted. And he wasn't just tempted a time or two. He was tempted in every way 
possible for a human to be tempted. There's nothing you've ever been tempted that you can say, well, Lord, you're pure and holy. You can't relate to what I'm going through. You don't, you don't know. Oh, yes, he does. He was tempted in that area too and did not give in. Proving you don't have to give in. He did it as a man. I think in so many respects, we have not seen the real Jesus. We've seen somebody's painting on a picture. We've seen somebody's idea and religious concept. But I'm telling you, Jesus is our hero. I'm telling you, he's real. He, he's not a picture in a book. He's real. He, came, he became a man and he came here and operated as a man. And pleased God and did the will of God and overcame every temptation. Oh, he's our hero. And here's, here's the great, great thing. You can be just like him. I know most people don't believe it, but it's what you're called to. You can live, you can walk, you can resist temptation, you can fellowship and pray, you can walk in victory just like Him. That's what you're called to. That's what I'm called to. 1 John 2, 6. He that says he lives or abides in Him ought himself also so to walk even as He Walks, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth, pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What is the prize? It's being just like Him. Did you know He is what we're going to be judged by? He is the standard. We're going to be held up by Him. To see how well we did. Someone said, oh God. <laughs> Don't forget the blood. <laughs> the blood means all your mistakes are gone. <laughs> but obedience... Doing the plan of God, whether you yielded or didn't yield, nobody can say, well, it was just too much. You don't understand, God, God you're, you're God. You're not a man like me. You don't know what it's like to be down there in the thick of all that curse and all that junk. Oh, yes, he knows exactly what it's like. Amen. Jesus was here. He did it. He dealt with all of it. And he proved what you could do as a man. He's my hero. When I grow up, I'm going to be just like him. How about you? What did the Bible say? When we see him, we're going to be so excited. What? We're going to be, we're already like him. And we should be becoming more so every day. Well, he was tempted of the devil. Now, what happened is what's described in 1 John. I'll read it to you. You don't have to turn there necessarily. But in 1 John, it describes three areas that lust operates. <clears throat> 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Verse 16, For all that is in the world, and he mentions three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And you can see that this is what the enemy enticed Adam and Eve with in the garden, in these three areas. And it's what happened. How many, how many uh, segments are described in this chapter of temptation right here? Three things. And you can see exactly that's what it correlates with. Why? Because that's what the enemy had been successful with every man and woman from Adam and Eve up to Jesus. It had worked on every one of them. Some way, some time. And so he did not 
the enemy did not intend on Jesus coming out of this unsoiled. He, he was convinced that he was going to fall and yield to temptation like everybody, every other man had up until him. Do you understand this? He, I mean, the Bible had not been written in the New Testament at that time. And this, the, this outcome that we already know about was not in his mind at all. What happened at first? He'd been, he'd been there for how long? 40 days. 40 nights. And in those days, he what? He did eat nothing. And when they were ended, what? He afterward hungered. Now this, this is like starvation hunger. You got appetite, and then it kind of goes away, and then it comes back with force. He's got serious hunger. Serious desire to eat. This is the lust of of the flesh. Now we, we say that like it's an evil thing always, but it doesn't have to be evil. The lust to eat when you're hungry is not an evil thing. But the King James word lust, when we hear it, it just sends your, your thoughts off on a tangent. It just means desire. He had a strong desire to eat. And you know you would after 40 days not eating. Right? He had a strong desire, and this is his flesh. This is the, the lust, the desire of the flesh. And the enemy said to him, if you're the son of God, command this stone that it may be made bread. What's going on here? What's going on here? Temptation. And that's right, he's enticing. Is Jesus tempted to do this? Yes, yes he is. Does, does he have a strong desire to do this? Does he believe he could? Yeah. Now here, let me ask you something. What would be wrong with him turning a few stones into some bread? He's hungry. What's wrong with that? He's really, really hungry. Somebody help me now. What would be wrong with it? <laughs> People are looking at me all over. What, what did he say? What did Jesus say? Oh, friends, don't, I know you've read this before, but don't, don't read it and hear it like you've heard it and like you know it. Put yourself out there in the desert. Jesus, he's operating as a man, but he's operating in the, in, in the, as a man is supposed to operate from Adam's time. He knows about the authority that the man's supposed to have in the earth. Speaking and the elements obeying your words. Is he tempted to do this? Yes, he is. What would be wrong with him doing it? It is wrong to be led by your desires. The desires of your flesh no matter how legitimate they may be. If you're led by your appetites, by your desires, you're not led by the Lord. You're letting something lead you other than the Father. Just because your flesh wants something, that does not mean you do it. Oh, come on, y'all help me with this now. Huh? Well, my flesh wants to sleep. That doesn't mean you automatically sleep. There are times when you should get up, when you should stay awake. Well, my flesh wants to eat. Well, there are times you don't need to eat. 
The Bible we read about people said their God is their belly. Well, what leads them? Their appetites lead them. They're people that follow, from the time they get up, they are following a desire for a drug. They're following a desire for the opposite sex or the same sex. They're following love of money. They are led all day long and all night long by desires. So they are sinning. Did, did Jesus want some bread? Yeah. Yeah. Was it strong? Did he believe he could speak to them and there'd be some nice, great, big, hot, whole wheat loaves right here and me could take a big bite of it and instantly feel better? Hmm? Do you think he could see it happening like right now? Was he tempted? Yes, he was tempted. But what did he say? What did he say? He said, it is written, that man shall not live by bread alone. My body's not the most important thing in my life. My appetite, my hunger is not the most important thing in my life. It's not bread alone that I live by, but by every word of God. And see, he did not have a word of God to turn these stones into bread. Yeah, but he's Jesus. He can do anything he wants to. No, he's our perfect example. He said, I always do those things that please the Father. And when you're a faith man or woman, you don't just do anything you decide to do. You're completely dependent on him. You look into him for every step. So he did not yield to his desire. He, he meant he's going to be led by the Spirit. He's going to be led by the Father's will. The Father did not tell him to do this. If he did this, he'd just be following his desire. He'd be led by the lust, the desire of his flesh. And he refused to do it. So he didn't yield to the temptation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say, my hero. my hero. And the devil was not done. He took him up into a high mountain and showed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. What would that have looked like? All the seats of power. All the dominion, all the heads of nations and the rulership, all the kingdoms of the world, he saw it. Didn't, didn't imagine it, he saw it. And the devil said, all this power, the word's authority, all this authority I will give you and I'll give you the glory of it. For that is delivered to me. He said, it was handed over to me. And to whoever I want to, I give it. I'll give it to you, he said. If you'll fall down and worship me, the whole deal will be yours. Now, there's been a lot of folks that said, he didn't have all the kingdoms and power of the authority. God has all that. He didn't have that. Well, then it wouldn't have been a temptation. Don't you think Jesus would have known? Was Jesus tempted by this? The Bible said he was tempted. What tempted him? No, notice it said it showed him. So this is that next thing, the desire of the eyes. This is what he's born for. King of kings. Right? This is... I mean, this, this pulls on him because yes. this is what he has come for. The king of kings, all the kingdoms and nations of the world are to be his and under him. It pulls on him. And the enemy says, just fall down. Worship me. 
And you can have it all. Now what is this pulling on? The desire of the eyes. So all the while this is going on, he is seeing all these kingdoms and as far as they reach to the ends of the earth and he's seeing all the military might, he's seeing all the people, he's seeing all the financial power and the political power of all the kingdoms of the world. Yep. Is he pulled? Yes, sir. Is he tempted? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now friend, there's, there's so much here. See, the enemy is subtle. He's cunning. He's crafty. And there are times when you know that God has called you to something in this area. But it's the wrong way. It's the wrong way. It's not just what you, what you get. It's how you got it that is so important. Well, you know, the ends justifies the means. No, it does not. No. It's not just what you get or what you've got or what you attain to. How you get it Amen. is so important. Yes. What do you look at him and say? Is he pulled? He's pulled. The desire is there. But he looked at him and said, It is written. Now first he said, You get out of my sight. You get, get out from my face. Why? Because he's suggesting that Jesus worship him. He said, in other words, that'll be the day when I worship you. Get out of my face. I don't want to see you. Get behind me. It is written, you worship the Lord your God. And him only do you worship. I will never worship you. Oh, he was pulled. I know I'm taking some time, but friend, can you put yourself in a situation where you're pulled? Hmm? You're pulled to, to want something. You're pulled to get something the wrong way, to take a shortcut, to, to tell a lie, to take something that's not yours. And there's something in your heart that this is like what you know you're supposed to have. Or are you listening? But can you be a man of God enough? Can you be a woman of God enough to be strong enough to say, uh-uh, no, no, I want it so bad I can taste it. But no. This is not the right way. This is not God. And I'm not yielding. I'm not. I'm going to stand and get God's best. It may take a while. But I'm going to get the right thing. The right way. God's way. God's time. Oh, come on, come on. It takes faith and patience. To get God's best. I know I was teaching some youth several years ago. And of course, you know, when you're 13, 14, 15, 16, you got wheels on the brain. <laughs> Driving. Cars. I know I did. And uh, I asked them. I said, guys, how many of you do not have a car of any kind? Well, most of them raised their hand. I said, guys, let me ask you a question here. I said, how many of you, if you could have a nice, I mean a nice, even a cool, used VW Bug, nice stereo, nice paint, but a VW Bug, but you got it now. I mean, you are mobile today. Or, Ride with mom for another four years and get a brand new Porsche Turbo paid for. Four years. Ride with mom or dad or whoever. I said, who wants a VW today? You know, about half of them raised their hand. 
Because when you're 15, four years is... <laughs> but how many know that'd be very foolish, wouldn't it? Because you could make it. And you know what I went on to talk to him about after that? Premarital sex. So somebody said, how's that relate? Well, who's going to grab the used VW now? <laughs> or who's going to stand and control herself and wait and get God's best? Oh, you, you, you have to put your flesh under you have to control yourself. Oh, but the days will pass. And soon you'll be there and you'll be so glad that you didn't settle. For some lust of the moment and somebody's... Well, I won't go on. <laughs> it takes faith. And it takes patience. It takes patience for Jesus. Okay? So he doesn't become king of kings and lord of lords today. When does he become it? It wasn't next week. And it wasn't next month. And it wasn't 100 years. And it wasn't 500 years. And we still do not see all the kingdoms of this world that have literally become the kingdoms of our Lord. But we will. I said we will. And he refused this pleasure for a moment and shortcut. Did you hear me? Worshiping the devil? No way. Sir, what's it talking about? Serving him? No way. What do you say? You get out of my face. You get behind me. I worship God, my Father, and Him only will I ever worship. And how many can see underneath that? And I will be King of Kings, and I will be Lord of Lords. Right? But I'm going to get it the right way. In the right time, and my, the, the desire of my flesh is not leading me. God is leading me. The desire of my eyes is not leading me. God is leading me. Can you do that? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You got time for the last one? What, what's left on the list from 1 John? Lust of the flesh? Lust of the eyes. And the last one is the pride of life. Was, he, was Jesus tempted in that area too? He was tempted in all points. Just like us. The Bible said, verse 8. Excuse me, verse 9. He brought him, the enemy brought Jesus to Jerusalem. And set him up on a pinnacle of the temple. Now Jerusalem... It's a busy, bustling place. And he said to him, If you be the Son of God, throw yourself off of here. For it is written. The devil quotes scriptures. <laughs> it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone he quoted it correctly didn't he yeah he did that's what the bible said that's what the scripture said see the enemy does that with, with us word people oh yeah I'm telling you, he is crafty. He's tricky. He's subtle, the Bible says. That's why you need the Holy Ghost. That's why you need the Bible. And you need to know what's in there. 
reading your chapter every day and things like that. And you need people around you that have more experience than you do. Because you can be quoting scriptures right and left and be just as wrong as wrong can be. Did you hear me? You can be. I know when I was first year Rama student working under Brother Kenneth Hagin. And this group of folk were doing some things in the areas of what they were calling signs and wonders and miracles. And man, I was so hungry for the power of God, I thought, yeah, yeah, buddy. And man, I, I did everything I knew to be a part of that. And, and Brother Hagin got up and got teaching about it. And I could tell by about 10 minutes he wasn't agreeing with it. And I thought, huh? Yeah, but the scripture says there'll be signs. Right? Fire and blood and smoke. And that's what they were quoting. And he went on and he went on and he went on. And I thought, mm. now the Bible says. Now here's a man that's got, you know, uh, six decades of experience beyond me. He said, personal visitations from the head of the church. And I still can barely find Mark 11, 23 at that point. <laughs> Takes me a while. I should have had some understanding and thought, well, hey, he probably knows some things I don't know. And thank God, by the grace of God, I did get a hold of that. And I thought, well, I think he's wrong. I didn't tell him that. Of course, he, he, he didn't hardly know me then. I didn't know him at all. I'm, I'm a student. I thought, I think he's wrong. These guys, you know, they got the fire. They got the fire. <laughs> See, <laughs> a lot of young Christians, they, they got a lot of zeal and no wisdom. And uh, eventually, I saw, he began to describe some things, and I thought, He's been there. He's seen all this before. And he's saying it ain't God. But the devil said, but it's scripture. Fire and blood and smoke. <laughs> is the devil quoting scripture here on, to Jesus? Yes. It is written. Why wouldn't you jump off of here? Chicken? Supposed to be the word of God. You believe the word? The word says his angels will bear you up. So why wouldn't you jump? If you believe it, you jump. Same mentality of snake handling. If you had enough faith, it is written. They'll take up serpents. So you better grab one and take him up. <laughs> and there's some folk that's no longer with us. <laughs> and there's some, I've had people tell me, well, God is in control. I just believe God is totally, totally in control, he's sovereign and he's omnipotent. And I just believe if I stepped out in front of that truck, that if it wasn't God's will, then that truck could not hurt me. You ever heard stuff like this? That's what he's saying. If you believe God, jump. Prove it. Now see, not only that, but are there all these people here who are doubting who he is? And wouldn't that be some good PR? <laughs> to come drifting down <laughs> off the pinnacle of the temple in the middle of Jerusalem. Ta-da! <laughs> Did you see that? He's got to be a prophet. He's got to be the one. Man, that would have, you know, that would have helped the services probably. <laughs> that 
that would have helped. You know, just give them a demonstration of real faith. Just step off. Now, friend, listen, because this kind of thing has happened so many times. People that are supposed to believe in healing, supposed to believe in prosperity. Well, if you really believe you're healed, throw your medicine away. Stomp your glasses. Prove it. If you really believe it, prove it. You are not called to prove that the word is true. You're called to believe it. You are not called to demonstrate to your family what faith is. I know y'all don't believe it, but I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove it. Just watch. Y'all all come. Look up on the top of the house tomorrow. I'm going to show you there's something to this. Yeah, they're going to see something. They're going to see how that pride goes before a... Because this is the last area. What's the temptation concerning? The pride of life. See, there's something in you. And see, we're anointed to admit that. But was there something pulling on Jesus? Yeah, show them. Show them. Those doctors of the law and Sadducees and Pharisees shut their mouths. Show them. Come drifting off of there in power, defying the laws of gravity. Yeah, that'll shut their mouths. Was he tempted? He was. But if he had followed it, what would he have been following? What would have been leading him? pride of, of life and really the enemy because see the enemy leads even Christians the enemy leads Christians through the desire of their flesh through the desire of their eyes and through the, their pride what did Jesus say he's already up there he's up on the pinnacle of the temple all he's got to do is say I believe the word of God that's all he's got to do but he wouldn't do it. What did he say? What did he say? It is said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Would that have been tempting God then? Yeah, it would have. Tempting God to what? We're talking about temptation. Now we're talking about tempting God. How would it have been tempting God? It would have been tempting God to let him fall. I know that sounds strange to you, but go back and study the scripture. He told the Israelites that he brought out of Egyptian bondage. He said, you've tempted me these ten times. What? Because they always kept saying, we all going to die out here in the desert. You brought us out here to kill us all. You all going to die. He said, you're tempting me. What? Tempted what? To let you die. And he did. <laughs> People say, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Forget Mother Nature. <laughs> it ain't smart to tempt God. Nature ain't my mother. It's a bunch of junk. God is the Father and Creator of the heavens and the earth. Believe Him. Trust Him. Obey Him. Don't tempt Him. Why shouldn't you step off of here to prove the Word? Because the Lord did not tell you to do that. And that's reason enough. Why would you be doing it? Out of pride, trying to show somebody something. Trying to prove something to somebody. Can you see all this? Oh, but he didn't yield. He was tempted, but he didn't yield. He was tempted, but he didn't yield. He was tempted again, but he did not yield. Did you notice how close he stayed to the Word? It is written. It is written. It's also written. 
How close he stayed to the word. How do you resist temptation? This is exactly how. Right here. Glory to God. Verse 13, did you notice this? And when the devil had what? Ended. No matter how severe the temptation is, there's an end to it. It can't last. Ended the temptation. He departed from him for a season. He ran out. These three things had always worked on every man and woman that had ever been on the planet. He does not know what to do next. This was supposed to work. If the first one didn't, the second one was supposed to. And if they didn't, the third one was sure supposed to. But neither one of them, even though he was tempted, did he yield to. And the devil's like, what do you do now? He offered him everything that he had control over. Yes. And he said, you get out of my face. Get behind me. Hallelujah. And he, he left. Friend, no matter how you're pulled, no matter how many times thoughts barrage, come and, and barrage your, your thinking and, and you're pulled and you're pulled, it can't last. It, that can't last. God won't allow it, the scripture said. Well, notice what happened. The devil ended the temptation. What's the next verse say? And he came out. How? In the power whoo, of the Spirit. That's when you start seeing the deliverances and the healings and the victories. Glory to God. The signs and the wonders. When you pass the test. Pass the test. Overcome the temptation. Pass. Don't yield. Don't yield. Don't yield. And then you come out in power. Oh, glory to God. Can you do what our master gave us the perfect example and showed us how to do it? Can you do it? Can you resist temptation? Can you stand against it? Even if it comes and wears on you for days, can you say no, no, and not now, and not ever? No. Even when, when your flesh wants to, your eyes want it, part of you wants it. Can you, by the grace of God, say, no, no, this is not right. This is not the right way. This is not God's leading. No. Amen. I, I will not give in. Amen. I will stand and get God's best for my life. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Stand on your feet. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Just begin to praise Him. Lift up your hands. Lift up your heart. Lord, we bless you. Nobody's greater than you, Lord. You are Lord of all. We worship you. We adore you, we adore you, we adore you. Oh, Lord, we are yours. We worship you. Lord, we are yours. We worship you. We will not yield. We will not give in. We will stand. We will trust. We will obey. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray for all the people under the sound of my voice that hear this now and we'll hear it later. Like you taught us to pray, I pray that you would strengthen them with strength by your Spirit in their inner man. That that same strength that was in Jesus as he resisted, 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 and did not give in, that same Spirit is in us. That strength is ours from you. 
And I pray it over these. And I say, Lord, stir them in their spirit. And make them very strong in their inner man. Lord, enlighten us to the subtleties, the craftiness of the enemy. We are not ignorant of his devices. For you have made us wiser than our enemies. We have an unction of you, of the Holy One, and we know all these things you make us to know. The enemy's plan and ploy and temptation and trickery. And by your grace, we'll not yield. We'll stand. We'll stand. Oh, thank you, Lord. Come on, pray in the Spirit. Worship God. Oh, hallelujah. Que for an ason de liade. Vondila mandela niendo so. Pray, mana, remana, remana. Zile veno so do so do se. Give an amason de ele manda niendo so. Ve banana na. Oh, priya, priya, no re, priya, no re, priya, no re. De la nason ko lenda yanda sala. De la nande anon zon don de go. Listen, the devil is telling people even right now. He's telling them, he said, you can't help it. You can't help it. You cannot say no. You, you can't quit. You are under the control of this thing. That is only true if you believe it. It, it is only so if you accept the devil's lies and you believe that. That's why you need to say out of your mouth, I am free. I've been delivered from all the power of darkness. I am not in bondage to any sin, any habit. I do not serve the lust of my flesh, the lust of my eyes, the pride of life. Jesus has made me free and I am free. Oh, thank you, Lord. Believe it. Believe it. Believe it. Do not say, no, I can't. I can't. I've tried and I can't. Don't say such a thing. Say, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. What key you in? Hmm? Hallelujah. I'm free. I'm free. There's nothing binding me by the blood of Jesus. I've been set free. Hallelujah. I'm free. I'm free. There's nothing binding me by the blood of Jesus. I've been set free. Not so long ago, I was bound by the enemy. With poverty and lack, and with sickness and disease. I heard the joyful sound that said redemption has been found. I heard the truth, and the truth has set me free. Hallelujah, I'm free, I'm free. There's nothing binding me by the blood of Jesus. Oh, there's power in the blood. Hallelujah, I'm free, I'm free. There's nothing binding me by the blood 
of Jesus I've been set free hallelujah now listen if you've never given your life to Jesus then you're not free but that can change right now everybody here watching by internet TV everybody either affirm or reaffirm your faith right now say it out loud I believe in God I believe in Jesus I believe he died on the cross paid the price for all my sins I believe he conquered death and has risen from the dead and is alive right now King of Kings Lord of Lords and I confess Jesus you are my Lord you are my Savior I receive you thank you for receiving me washing me setting me free I will follow you I will serve you all my days and beyond this life for you've made me free oh sing it again hallelujah I'm free I'm free there's nothing binding me by the blood of Jesus by the precious blood of Jesus I've been set free hallelujah I'm free the blood of Jesus I've been set free now what do you do if the devil comes to you and he paints the most enticing picture and it's what you want you want it what do you do <laughs> get out of my face and take that stuff with you yeah, I know that part of me wants it, but there's another part of me, and that's my spirit that's stronger than my mind and my eyes and my flesh and my love for God and His will is greater than my love for anything else. And I'm free. And I can say no. And I cannot yield and I can be strong because greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm free by the blood of Jesus. Come on, sing it with me. I've been set free. Hallelujah, I'm free. I'm free. Oh, there's nothing binding me by the blood of Jesus. Oh, by the blood of Jesus, I've been set free. Not so long ago. Not so long ago. We were bound by the enemy With poverty and lack Things like sickness and disease I heard the joyful sound that said Redemption has been found I heard the truth And the truth has set me free Oh, I'm free I'm free there ain't nothing binding me by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, I've been set free. And I'm free right now. Hallelujah. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. There's nothing binding me by the blood of Jesus. Oh, yeah. I've been set free. You can go as you say. Oh, I'm free. I'm free. There's nothing binding me by the blood of Jesus. By the precious blood of the Lamb. I've been set free. He's already set me free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. There's nothing binding me by the blood of Jesus. I've been set free.